Uh, welcome again, and welcome back, I should say, to Melanie Phillips um, and to our viewers, because this is the second of two conversations between Melanie and me. Um, I'm John O'Sullivan, by the way. Uh, this is one of the Danube uh, Dialogues, uh, which we've been holding during the lockdown. Uh, we no longer call them lockdown dialogues, by the way, because the lockdown has more or less been lifted here. Uh, but we had to break off the earlier conversation, and now I want to resume it. So I'm just going to say a few more things for, about Melanie, um, to um, repeat them rather, for people who are joining us for the first time. Um, she is a British journalist, an author, public commentator. She began her career writing for The Guardian and The New Statesman, and she was very much identified uh, with the left in journalism. Um, however, uh, she gradually began to have doubts. We discussed some of those last time, and we'll obviously, Melanie, return to them a bit today. Um, but in the years of your, in your years of journalism, you appeared as a panelist on the BBC Radio 4 programme, The Moral Maze, uh, on BBC One's Question Time, that's its principal uh, public affairs debate programme. You've been awarded the Orwell Prize for Journalism. That was when you were writing for The Observer. Um, and as I say, you have now moved to a very uh, different situation. You are now a leading conservative voice in British uh, journalism, I would say in transatlantic journalism, and of course I imagine in Israel where you live part of your life. Um, now, uh, we talked, discussed this in general terms before, but let me ask a couple about uh, the issues that played particular parts in your change. Uh, um, let me ask first of all about immigration. Uh, because that's an issue which um, is among conservatives has been controversial, not simply between left and right. And yet you have um, seen that as a reason to swing to the right. Um, well, uh, I've written about immigration uh, on and off uh, for many years, um, and I find it a very uh, painful uh, issue, actually, because I am the child, and rather I'm really the grandchild and great-grandchild of immigrants. My grandparents and great-grandparents immigrated to Britain around the turn of the 20th century. And I think that for many, if not most, Jewish people, we all have that very much in our minds, um, that uh, we were discriminated against, people didn't want us, we fled around the world, and so on. Um, so it is painful uh, to have to confront this in a more in a, in, the, in the kind of realistic way that I have tried to do over the years, because it has always seemed to me that there is a difference between uh, immigration, uh, which can and does very much enhance a nation by bringing in people of value, uh, with skills that are wanted, uh, that they add to the diversity of the nation, which is in itself a good thing. Um, but there is a difference between migration and mass migration. Um, and that is the phenomenon that we've been uh, uh, coping with in the last uh, few years, where you have this enormous uh, movement from south to north, fueled by often very distressing circumstances, war, uh, famine, extreme poverty. Um, but there is a limit to the numbers that people can, that countries can accommodate. Uh, simply in terms of physical infrastructure, uh, in Britain, for example, I've forgotten now the precise figures, you'll have to forgive me, but the current rate of immigration into Britain uh, means that within, I don't know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, Britain would have to build the equivalent of, you know, some of its major cities. It's just not doable, the pressure on public services simply from the weight of numbers, the, the medical provision, uh, the educational provision, the schools, the hospitals, the, the GP, the general practitioner surgeries, um, is just too much. And then you have the even more toxic issue of culture, because I do believe that um, a nation is enhanced by immigration, but only up to a point. If you get to the point where so many people are coming in, that it's impossible to transmit the indigenous culture to those people and knit them in to the national story, then the national story stops being the national story. And that is not right because people are entitled to live in a culture that they identify with, that they share with others. And this really boils down to an issue that I've grappled with for many years, 
uh, which is intimately related to immigration and intimately related to Britain's membership of the European Union, the whole issue of transnationalism, the orthodoxy in the West for the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, that even, in fact more, I would say going back to the Second World War, that the Western nation is intrinsically bad. It's intrinsically exclusive, intrinsically illegitimate, intrinsically colonialist and racist and all the rest of it. And consequently, the West has no entitlement to what it considers to be its national culture, which is encompassed by a nation which decides on its own laws in accordance with that national culture and which has borders which it polices because without properly enforced borders, there can be no nation. So I've been banging away at all that kind of stuff for uh, several years. And as a result, uh, like anybody who talks about any aspect of all of that, one gets labelled immediately as a kind of knuckle-dragging, troglodyte, racist bigot. Uh, but, you know, hey, you know, that's yeah. what one has to put up with. <laughs> now, let me ask you then two questions that flow from that. I've been an editor of about four magazines and a couple of newspapers. Now, um, in that time, I've always been looking for a particular article. I've commissioned it on a dozen occasions, more, more than that. And that is, what explains the cultural masochism, the cultural self-hatred, which underlies the attitude you've been criticizing? And I've had lots of very interesting answers to that question. I've never had one that I felt satisfactory. I've never had one that felt explained to me why people who are living in free, independent, um, prosperous, pretty socially just and fair societies as far as you get in human life, uh, which are clearly much better than most of the other societies in the world, and indeed people arrive in Britain, say, from those societies because they want to better their lives, not to make them worse. So what explains the hostility to the society, not of the new arrivals, um, they might suffer things that would put them off, but of the people who actually hold responsible and important positions in our own societies. Why are they, so many of them, not all, but so many of them seemingly instinct instinctively hostile to the, to the nation they're in and anxious to submerge it in something else? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, first of all, shame and guilt. Um, for the last several decades, we've taught ourselves that, you know, history began uh, with the empire, with the British empire. And British history is entirely one of colonialist exploitation. And that's what the West has basically told itself. Um, and yes, exploitation and colonialism were part of those stories, but only a part. So that's, you know, shame and guilt is, is the first bit. The second bit is the doctrine of relativism, uh, moral and cultural relativism, that again, we've all taught ourselves as the orthodoxy uh, for several decades, which means that it is simply wrong to have a hierarchy of values. Um, everyone's values have to be considered to be of equivalent value to everyone else's. That goes from your personal life to your national life. So no culture can say that it is better than any other culture. So liberal society with its values of, you know, um, freedom of expression and equality of women and all the things that we hold dear, we are not entitled to say that's better than other uh, cultures. And so we're not entitled to uphold those values. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, um, and I, 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 I've thought about this quite a lot, and I've come to this conclusion that what I've just described is a, is a kind of ideological uh, defeatism, um, which, as you imply, is a kind of a cultural suicide, a culturally suicidal. So why on earth have we all fallen victim to that? <laughs> <laughs> or why has our intelligentsia fallen victim to that? And I think, I think this actually does go back to the Holocaust and the Second World War, which I think um, did ter almost terminal damage to the West's idea of itself. I mean, you have the Holocaust, which uh, took place not in some benighted backwater of the globe, but at the very, in the very crucible, the very apex of um, high culture, Germany, high culture, a country that was, you know, proud of its cultural heritage that venerated. I mean, you know, they, they sent people to the gas chambers to the sound of Mozart playing. I mean, that's how sick this was. But 
They were, you know, people who venerated Goethe and Schiller and, and Mozart and Beethoven and all, and all that kind of stuff. And I think after people realized what had happened in the Holocaust, I think people said to themselves at some deep level, this is what the West did. Um, this is what we did. We thought of ourselves as the pinnacle of rationality, of civilization, of culture, of conscience. And this is what we did. And so therefore there is something fundamentally wrong with modernity, with the West. And I think that went very deep. And I think that demoralized our, uh, the leaders of our culture so that a number of people came along and they saw the opportunity um, uh, to remake the West. They themselves were full, full of this belief that the West was intrinsically evil because this is what it had done. But they also had a kind of, uh, well, it was a Marxist revolutionary belief uh, that uh, you had to change the West. And you had to change it uh, not by the workers rising up and seizing the levers of economic and political power, that would never happen, but much more intelligently through seizing the levers of the culture, through getting inside the culture, into the universities, into the media, into the professions and all the institutions of the culture and turning its values inside out. And I think that, you know, the demoralization caused by the Holocaust and the Second World War, um, uh, among other things, I think that left our um, uh, brightest and best, if you like, uh, vulnerable to a set of really, as you, as you say, culturally suicidal ideas that if the culture had been healthy, it would have been seen off. They would have been seen off. But it wasn't healthy. It was demoralized. And so it bought into them and with the results that we've been living through. Let me pursue this for one moment. I can absolutely see how that could be true of uh, Germany and Germans. And I have some sympathy with young Germans who are struggling with a legacy which it's impossible for them, in a sense, to make sense of and still be, make healthy uh, decisions. Um, I have some sympathy with the idea that other countries in Europe which had substantial support uh, after 1940, but even before it, for the same set of um, ideas. But in Britain and in America, in which those ideas had never had much purchase. I mean, the fascists didn't get elected a single MP in the 1930s in Britain. Uh, and in America, of course, it was very far away and other things were dominating them. They were slow to come to realize what was happening at all in, in Europe. So why should these countries, particularly, and particularly now, after a post-war period in which great things have been achieved, uh, living standards have been increased, um, increasingly ambitious ideas of democracy and liberalism have been established in these societies, and any complaint about colonialism is now well in the past because all of the empires uh, have been given away, and in the case of some empires like the British, I think with relatively harmonious relations between the former imperial power and the leading circles in those countries. So why should these countries, and particularly why should the conservatives in these countries in some, per, in some way have succumbed to the same um, sort of moral come mental disease you've analysed? Well, we'll come to conservatives in a moment. But first of all, what I've just described took place then um, and it took root in our educational institutions. So it's become the orthodoxy. People don't sort of think in the way that I've just described because, it, mm. as you say, it's in the past, but they, it's just become an assumption that white uh, Western society is fundamentally racist and colonialist. I'm trying to explain how that happened. And so I go back a half a century and more, but it's now become, you know, a, a sort of self-perpetuating orthodoxy, mm. uh, if you like. The particulars of Britain, um, uh, as you say, why on earth should Britain and America have gone along with this? Well, I think there were particulars. Um, uh, there were things that were particular to them and things that were particular or rather general in the West. I do think that they were affected by this Western demoralization to this extent that, you know, this is a hard thing to say, but I believe it to be true that although they were countries, Britain and America, that fought Nazism and defeated fascism, fought for freedom, 
absolutely, no question. Um, nevertheless, uh, they were, to put it mildly, bystanders to the Holocaust. Um, they denied, America denied access uh, to America of those Jewish refugees. Britain uh, reneged on its internationally binding legal requirement or duty to take Jews into what was then Palestine, uh, a duty that had been imposed upon it or it had accepted in the 1920s uh, by the international community agreeing this should happen. It reneged on that in the 30s and the 40s and it denied access to Palestine of Jews who then went to their deaths in Europe. So in my view, the West, and we're not even talking now about the European countries, but Britain and America did not, uh, were not sort of just noble bystanders to the Holocaust. They actually had a part in it. Yeah, let me just argue that, um, of course, we're making a judgment about the, the, the behavior of our own people in the past, based on what they didn't know and we know. I mean, they did not know what was going to happen in 1941, 2 and 3 and 4. And, and yet, and, and consequently, um, they can't really be seen as being complicit in quite the way you were suggesting. I don't think that's quite true. I think there is ample evidence uh, that Roosevelt knew exactly what was going on. Um, OK, not exactly. The full, the full horror became gradually apparent, but they certainly knew. In 1942, they knew. Uh, they knew and they were asked to take uh, people and they refused. Um, and anyway, uh, I yeah. think that this, this sort of sets up, you know, a guilt that can't be, can't be really dealt with. Now, there were specifics also about Britain. Britain was demoralized when it, at the end of the war. It had just won the war against fascism, uh, but it was bankrupt. It was in hock to America, badly in debt to America. And it was in the process of losing its empire and not finding a role, to use the cliche. And I think that had a profoundly demoralizing effect. And then you get to the, you know, the Suez debacle of 1956, which famously uh, you know, knocked, the stuffing, what, knocked what remained of the stuffing out of the British ruling class. They then decided you know, Britain was just you know, past it and it, 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 it was, it was a, de a defeated world power. And it just won the war, but it was a defeated world power. And I think that these that for Britain, those things were very specific to Britain. And when it comes to America, America had another guilt trip. America told itself, uh, America did have a, you know, a, a relatively recent shameful history in terms of its black people, its black citizens. Um, you know, it's really very recent uh, that it, it, it instituted equality. And it's not been able, I think, to process that guilt at all. Um, and it's come out in all kinds of different ways in a rather pathological way. But I think that fundamentally, it made America very vulnerable uh, to this revolutionary idea that if you teach a society that it's intrinsically bad, then it will turn itself inside out and destroy itself and become something different. And I think that these particulars in America and in, uh, in Britain, and also don't forget uh, the war in Vietnam, which I think also had a kind of shattering effect on American morale. So there were specifics uh, which kind of fed into this, I would say, vulnerability of the professional, the, the, the intelligentsia and the political class in both Britain and America uh, against the background of a, a, a kind of uh, pan-European, pan-Western view that the West had committed a terrible a terrible thing uh, in the Holocaust and Second World War and was therefore intrinsically bad. But I think these things all fed into each other and have been used, uh, manipulated, if you like, uh, by uh, uh, ideological actors who have seized, seen and seized the opportunity to remake society in a revolutionary way. Well, let me then turn to exactly that point, because you diagnosed in well, what you've written um, a much wider loss of faith, as you've been saying, not simply in the West itself, but also in things associated with Western civilization, uh, truth, uh, reason, um, liberty. Now, those things were challenged by Marxism and its, in its various varieties uh, in the last 30 to 40 years. 
But what strikes me as interesting is that in the long march through the institutions, the people who ran the institutions at the beginning were liberal-minded, decent people. But why did they not recognize that the people they were dealing with who would replace them, who would supplant them, and who would do so by methods that included intimidation and political organization rather than excellence in scholarship and, and uh, performance? Why did they not recognize they were dealing with some kind of virus very similar to what the Nazis and the communists, uh, Soviet communists, had represented in the past, and which now were there in a more subtle and dangerous form, because they didn't resist effectively. No, um, uh, I mean, they weren't seen as such. Um, uh, it was a kind of change that swept through society uh, swept through the section of society that thought itself to be liberal and it didn't realize it was actually being taken over by uh thinking which was basically marxist um and i mean i you know i i lived through this at the guardian that's exactly what happened at the guardian uh, the guardian when it was the manchester guardian uh, was a truly liberal paper um mm. uh, in the old-fashioned sense sort of gladstonian liberal um and then it moved to London and it changed. Now, it partly changed because it moved to London, you might say. Yeah. But it changed because the left changed during that time. And the idea of liberalism just got sort of snuffed out. Now, why did it get snuffed out? Snuffed out? Well, I think it was what was going on in the universities, which wasn't really recognized at the time, that the kind of ideas that were being uh, thought and were, were, that that were being that were that were becoming accepted as as normal didn't didn't they didn't present themselves as Marxism I and mean, Marxism, you know, was a creed which was very much associated with uh, the workers, the working class, and uh, economics um, and political structures. Now, what I was living through, what I was dealing with, what, what I, th I felt was kind of creeping through the intelligentsia and the educational system was nothing to do with that. And no one talked in those terms. They talked in different terms. They talked in terms of um, equality. Um, egalitarianism became the big thing. And they talked in terms of everybody being uh, equal in their value system and that it was just not nice to uh, look down on anybody who had a different lifestyle, different sexuality, a different uh, household, family, marriage arrangement, and not very nice to uh, look down on other cultures, and therefore not very nice uh, to say that your culture was different and better than any other culture. And that became that became considered, that was considered to be liberal. It wasn't considered to be Marxist. Marxists were the uh, dingy, dreary, humorless people who sat in public houses, uh, dressed in dungarees, and talked interminably about stuff that nobody could understand, and fought with each other in a ridiculous way, and wrote newspapers that nobody in their right mind would want to read, like the Morning Star, um, and, and, and believed rubbish. That's how that was thought of. Nobody thought that the that, that section of the world, or that's that that way of thinking, uh, was nobody realised it was taking cultural form. And we mentioned you mentioned conservatism, which we haven't touched on, because the point was that the conservatives never understood this. The conservatives, I'm talking about Britain, I can't really speak for anyone else, but in Britain, as far as I could see, the Conservative Party and the those who th thought of themselves as conservatives with a capital C, um, stopped realizing what it was they needed to conserve because they didn't realize that it was being uh, destroyed. And why didn't they realize it? Uh, because I think conservatives, first of all, didn't really think in cultural terms. They thought in broadly economic terms, I'm afraid. Um, they'd stopped thinking in cultural terms. And secondly, and I think the great turning point was the, from the point of view of conservatives, uh, the great crisis inflection point, if you like, uh, was the fall of the Soviet Union. 
which in my view, you know, it was falling a long time in, in, in terms of its, of, 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 of its power mm. over people's minds. It was falling a long time before the Berlin Wall, before the Berlin Wall actually fell. But when, conservative, when communism actually did disintegrate, when the Soviet Union did disintegrate, and I remember picking this up among conservatively minded individuals, they sat around saying, well, what do we do now for an encore? Uh, we've shot our fox. Um, it's gone. Yeah. The Soviet Union has collapsed. It's no longer a threat. Communism is over. And everyone's bought the market. Francis Fukuyama wrote famously or infamously, The End of History. And the conservatives kind of bought into that. Yeah, everyone's now, you know, everyone, the, the free market now rules. So our job is done. So where do we go from here? And I remember people saying, well, uh, we now have to hang our hat on the value of liberty. This is what will define us as conservatives. And I thought, oh, no, my goodness, they had completely lost it because liberty was the watchword by now of the so-called liberal left. They said we should be free to express ourselves in exactly the way we want and behave in the way we want and nobody should tell us otherwise and we don't think we should have any rules of behavior in the social and cultural sphere. So they were kind of social libertarians and the conservatives were economic libertarians. They said everything will be great if everything is run according to market principles. And I remember thinking at the time, that's it. The conservatives are going to become part of the left. They will not ever understand what I can now see is happening, which is that the left is running rough, riding roughshod over the values that bind us as a community, tradition, the inherited uh, set of values that form a nation. The idea that our nation is better than other nations because our values are better than any other, uh, the conservatives just don't even understand that this is being abolished. And not only did they not understand it, but then of course what happened was, um, everybody seemed to basically agree that society was changing in these ways. And so the conservatives sat around saying, well, we can't be like Canute and hold back the waves of social progress. We're gonna lose power unless we go along with this. And so we must just adapt to it. We can't do anything about it. And so they never even understood what it was they should be fighting, what it was they should be conserving. They never even tried to do so. Melanie, two quick supplementaries. Um, first, about Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism. Um, I, in, I instinctively sense from what you've just said that you do not place Margaret Thatcher on the pinnacle, which I almost unqualifiably do. Um, and I'd like to get your diagnosis of what's wrong with her and what's right with her, because I think you have mixed feelings in a way. Well, indeed. And, uh, you know, uh, Back in, whenever, when, when was it, 19, uh, 19, 90, 1996, I think it was, um, I published uh, my book on education, uh, the, the, the collapse of education and the collapse of morality uh, in mm. Britain. It was called All Must Have Prizes. Mm. And uh, in that, I described broadly what I've been telling you about the collapse of education and moral values. Um, but I had a chapter in that in which I basically said, um, Thatcherism uh, is the problem. It's not the solution because it doesn't understand any of this. Um, it sees the world in, in terms of economics. It see sees it through a an economic prism. And I did think that of Mrs. Thatcher uh, at the time. Um, uh, I thought that, um, well, it, it is a matter of, of, of record that it took her a long time before she understood there was any problem with the education system. I think uh, her great education reform was in 1988 um, and she'd come to power uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 79. Um, uh, and when she did finally realize there was something wrong with education, she never really got it. 
she thought it's just ridiculous these teachers are not teaching um, people are not teaching children to read and write properly and they're not teaching children to add up and so we have to get back to you know to their sort of basics back to the basics of education that was true but she never understood why she never understood the bigger picture that this was part of what I was sitting through these debates by these uh, the history of teaching establishment of Britain, mm. who said in terms, the idea of education being the transmission of a culture down through the generations is over. We can't do that because the culture is fundamentally rotten. We have to teach children something quite different. And she never got that. She never understood that. Um, and she never understood the extent to which the entire academy, the entire educational superstructure had been taken over by this. And so her solution to the, uh, the, back, the back to basics uh, issue in education was to set up a national curriculum, which would be written by the very same people. She never understood what was going on. Um, and so, uh, and I had a deeper problem with her because she was a radical. Uh, she was a, I would say, you know, sort of, she was described as a Manchester liberal, which is basically a, to do with her economic view of the world. But it was, she was, she was somebody who believed that tradition was a kind of conspiracy against the consumer. She believed the professions were a conspiracy against the consumer. She believed they were cartels of, uh, they were kind of closed systems of, of, uh, of, of individuals. Uh, who acted against the public interest. Now, to a certain extent, she was absolutely correct. But her solution to that was to marketize it all, uh, to make them open to competition. And in the process, and I wrote this in All Must Have Prizes, in my view, at that time, she had destroyed the most precious thing of all, which is utterly intangible, which is trust and tradition and the inheritance of values. You can't put a price on this. And, you know, that degree of trust, and what I just talked about, trust and tradition, all that sort of stuff, that is at the heart of a professional relationship, which cannot be replicated by a market system. A market system destroys it. And I believe she destroyed it with the professions. I believe she destroyed uh, the British civil service. Now, there was a lot wrong with the British civil service, and I understood entirely her frustration that they set out to, in her view, frustrate her radical reforms. I'm sure that was true. But what she did was destroy what was most precious, which was something which was, again, intangible. This sense that the civil service had a sense of itself as completely above and beyond politics and represented a national interest, um, as a result of which they always, uh, they had a duty to tell ministers the unvarnished truth, even if ministers would bawl them out, because they knew that they would not be punished for that. But she did punish them. She got rid of them. And I thought that was uh, unforgivable. Uh, you know, I think any, I, I've, I have to reluctantly acknowledge that there is a great deal of truth in your analysis of Thatcherism, which I would say is even stronger when John Major comes in and adopts what John Gray once called Thatcherism on autopilot. But, but, but I don't uh, think that it's true entirely of Margaret Thatcher, but I'm afraid that's something you and I'll have to address on some other occasion. Just to put, put the record straight, I yeah, did think yeah. she was a great, great Prime Minister and did things which were terrific. Um, and what she did that was most terrific was she had a sense, she had a, such an iron belief in the, uh, in the promise and the ability of her country. And she wanted it again to believe in itself. And for the what, time that she was prime minister, I believe she, she did that. And that was a great gift. Well, I'm glad you said that. But I also would say, by the way, uh, you, um, a prime minister doesn't always choose the battles and topics on which he or she will address. She had to deal with the Soviet Union, the decline of Britain economically, inflation. So she she was gradually getting on to other things, but 
she, she wasn't allowed, nor is any politician, political leader ever allowed to finish the job in a democracy. But I want to move to another point, and it's this really. Um, I think anyone who's been listening so far will think your analysis of the cultural changes and the power of culture in making these changes is, is r completely realistic. But there is, and it's, it's odd that I should be accusing you of this, um, because of your own personal record, but it seems to me that the role of intimidation and compulsion and uh, the manipulation of language so that they become lies in, for in fora where you expect um, standards to be upheld, they're very important elements in the revolutionary changes we've both been discussing. And I wonder if you'd like to talk about that. And the reason is, I think that leads into the question of what is happening today, what's been happening in the last week in the United States of America. Yes, well, uh, language is tremendously important. And in my view, uh, part of the uh, processes that we've been describing, uh, talking about, um, have involved the hijack of language. So words have been twisted to mean their absolute opposite. Uh, so, for example, liberal. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is nobody more illiberal than somebody who is posing today mm. as a liberal. Um, uh, uh, um, the notion of rationality has been turned on its head. Um, the idea of justice has become social justice, which is actually injustice. Uh, social justice is actually the rule of the strong over the weak uh, through intimidation and other terrible uh, uh, sorts of human behavior. Uh, victim culture, victims posing as victims. I say posing because it's basically a get out of jail free card very often. Uh, for bad behavior. If you're a victim, you are uh, uh, morally uh, in the clear because you cannot be guilty of bad things if you're a victim and all of that. And we're living in a kind of Orwellian, to use a cliche, but it's true, uh, an Orwellian society. And you know, what Orwell was writing about was basically the Soviet Union. He was writing about the, the, the genius, the absolute genius of the Soviet way of um, this, the, this, the, the Soviet uh, 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 strategy uh, for controlling a population, which was to basically fry people's minds and make them believe black was white. And that's what we're living through. And I don't think it is a coincidence. I think that this thing that we're living through has been fed actively uh, by Soviet ide ideologues going back decades but I think that, you know, they and there's, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of evidence from people who defected from the Soviet Union who said this, people in the former intelligence services in that in, in that world uh, who said that's what they set out to do. And they've done it. They did it. They understood that they could export um, the revolution uh, to the West. They understood the gullibility of the West. They understood its weak points. Uh, and they played on it. And I think that it's therefore no coincidence, that we're, no, no accident, that we're living through an inversion of truth and lies. Absolutely no question about it. Um, so, um, uh, what was the other thing you said? Well, I was suggesting uh, that the role actually also of physical intimidation, uh, the, ability, the inability of speakers of a con conservative or even a moderate left frame of mind from being able to address an audience which wants to hear them, and the failure of universities um, to, to protect free speech in these circumstances. And then when they are criticized, they take a resort to the argument that, that an attack on them is an attack on academic freedom, although there is almost no academic freedom in a lot of faculties um, for, a, for you know because they are dominated by people of a particular point of view who don't accept the legitimacy of other points of view. Well, quite. And it's a real trison des clercs, isn't it? It's a real treason of the clerical class mm that's going on in universities. And I think there are two reasons for it. Uh, one is that I think quite a large number of people who run our universities and colleges actually themselves believe this rubbish. Um, they actually, you know, they, yes. they, it's they, hard they, to believe. <laughs> they, they can't see a problem with it. And those who can see a problem with it, I'm afraid the vast majority uh, run for cover. It's heads below the parapet. Um, and, you know, it does take the most enormous courage to stand up to this. 
Um, on the other hand, there is uh, security in number and in numbers. And if enough of the people who run our institutions had courage and stood up, then we would have a different situation. But uh, as things stand, uh, they take the path of least resistance. It's human nature. It's deplorable, but that's how it is. And for those two reasons, our universities uh, have stopped being the crucibles of um, reason, uh, freedom of expression, uh, knowledge, and they become in, instead uh, the, uh, the cauldron uh, of unreason, uh, intimidation, illiberalism, and um, uh, really, um, you know, Jacob Talmon got it right. Was it in 1952 he wrote this book? Cultural totalitarianism. That's what we're living through, and there's no other word for it. Well, as a matter of fact, that does lead on to the situation in the United States. I've just read something you've written about this in the last few days, and you make the point that what is disappearing there is the rule of law. Um, that, that's all of these disorders um, and, uh, and, and worse uh, are, res are the result of increasingly the American establishment broadly defined, um, not simply its political element, but its cultural business um, and um, the, the element of the cultural institutions like um, foundations and think tanks, they have now become, in a sense, the enforcers of a, of a set of laws which are not on the statute books, which weren't passed democratically, but which are, in effect, um, the application of their ideas, of which, and the ideas of those we've been discussing. And what I want to ask now is, um, as we look at what's going on, isn't it extraordinary, for example, um, and you will think of other examples, isn't it extraordinary that the, f the facts and figures for, uh, of police brutality um, do not support the almost universal claim um, that there is a war by the police against black America. There are certainly occasions where um, black, uh, black people are unjustly treated and killed um, by, um, by um, a police. It does happen. It happens on a bigger scale in relation to other groups in the community as it happens. But um, somehow or other, we now are witnessing a society which is undergoing an enormous convulsion and one wonders the, uh, the role of um, institutions that are meant to protect democracy, sometimes to correct it, but which are here egging on the disorder and the violence and the self-hatred. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, and there's a lot that's contributing mm. to this terrible, these terrible scenes that we're seeing uh, in America. Um, victim culture, um, you know, black resentment, um, but as you say, um, the, uh, the facts and figures don't support this idea of the police being institutionally racist or America being institutionally racist. Uh, clearly, there is a problem in the police uh, of uh, racism. But, you know, a number of the incidents, as I recall, over the last several years, uh, which have led to minor, mm. relatively minor conflagrations of this kind over alleged police racism towards black people have involved black officers. So the situation is much, much more complicated than that. But I think that just like we were saying that um, the intimidation on campus is facilitated by the uh, authorities sitting on their hands or even egging them on, um, so this, I think, uh, and I, you kindly refer to what I wrote uh, uh, yesterday um, on my blog, um, I think this is very similar because you have a situation where, you know, it's obviously a complete breakdown of law and order. It's what we've been seeing in the last mm. few days in America, and very shocking it is. Um, and there's no excuse for that. There's, there's no explanation for that other than, than that people have behaved in a thuggish fashion. There is ample evidence that this has been significantly organized uh, by groups like Antifa, uh, that some of those organizers, if not many, uh, are white people, um, that this is a kind of seen as a kind of revolutionary moment. And that is particular to itself and needs to be discussed and analyzed in itself. But I do think that this has to be put into the context of a country, America, which for many years 
has been indulging itself in lawlessness, which has been approved, condoned, and actually enacted by the Democratic Party. Now, I'm thinking, and I refer, you know, I, I, I wrote about this specifically. There are a couple of obvious examples. Uh, one is um, uh, immigration. I mean, I went to America, I go to America quite often on speaking tours or in when we used to have such things, I used to go on speaking <laughs> tours in America, real life speaking tours. And I went in 2017 and I went to what's impolitely called flyover country and President Trump had not that recently been an elected president and I was interested to talk to Trump voters. And what struck me uh, with great force was that their overwhelmingly their complaint was, and the reason why they voted for Trump, was that they perceived that America had stopped being a country under the rule of law. And they wanted, they saw in Trump somebody who would restore it. And they were particularly exercised, among other things, uh, by, um, well, they were exercised by the breakdown of law and order. Uh, so they said to me, for example, uh, we can no longer go to a Republican rally in safety because we will be beaten up by Antifa or other types of thugs and the police will be under instruction from whoever it is in the American mm. judicial justice yeah. political hierarchy. But they're basically democratic states with democratic governors and democratic attorney generals and or uh, dis district attorneys, I should say, and so on and so forth. The police in those democratic states, they told me, uh, the police here in this democratic state are under an instruction that if Republicans are being beaten up, the police look, at it, look the other way. Look the other way. They will only get involved if liberals are being beaten up. And that's a, it's a politically ideologically directed thing. That was the first thing they said to me. The other thing they said to me was, you know, immigration. Um, uh, you know, we have illegal immigrants who are being sheltered uh, by one arm of the state against another arm of the state so that they are able to just to go around and commit crimes with impunity, including murder. And I, I just couldn't believe this. I thought this was astonishing. And then even more astonished was I to find the whole notion of sanctuary cities. I said, what is it a sanctuary from? It's a sanctuary from the law. So you have this institutionalization of law breaking because the people who were in control at the time, Democratic Party, Democratic governors, state governors, Democratic president, believed that their idea of how our society should be organized, which involved you know, bringing in lots of immigrants and, and issuing amnesties for illegal immigrants and so on, was, was, so, was, was so important that the rule of law had to be literally made subservient to that. Now, there are many other examples. I mean, President Obama's abuse, the abuse by the Obama administration of the Internal Revenue Service, which singled out conservatives for... Um, uh, persecution, basically, by the IRS. Um, a, a whole number of things like that. Um, and, you know, you have this... I, I was just astounded to hear all this. And it was quite clear to me that this was a major, if not the major reason why so many people voted for President Trump, because they understand, or understood and understand, that one of America's core values, its core foundational values, is that it is bound by the Constitution and the rule of law. And they perceive that in so many ways that had been allowed to, not just allowed to, but encouraged to disintegrate as a matter of policy by the Democratic Party. Um, and then, you know, put that aside, that was then, and, and then we had, you know, the whole business of President Trump uh, and his immigration uh, policy. But then you have the whole business of the Russia collusion scandal, um, which at the very best involved a uh, deliberate uh, perversion of justice by elements in the justice establishment and the political establishment on the very best analysis because they genuinely believe that President Trump was in hock to the Russians. And so they broke the law. The worst analysis 
is that they corrupted the entire judicial and justice process in order to protect the then democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton from proper accountability for her alleged crimes, and in the course of which they entered into a conspiracy against Donald Trump to prevent him from coming, becoming president, and when he became president, to lever him out of office in a kind of coup, a political coup. Either way, you have elements of the political and judicial establishment with other assorted uh, uh, officials of the administrative class in America uh, conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Now, if you have a country like that, where this is done at the highest level, then it's not really very surprising that malign elements can think we can get away with a lot of stuff. And I, 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 I came back to um, something again I've been so impressed by in the past in America, which was the broken windows theory, which turned around the city of New York, had, which had had a terrible crime rate, and the broken windows theory turned it into theory turned it into um, a model uh, uh, state. Why? What was the broken windows theory? It was the idea that if you have low level uh, disorder or incivilities like uh, urinating in the street, uh, like broken windows not being repaired, like beggars who are uh, homeless people who are allowed to beg in a, in, a, in, a, in a menacing fashion. These things had been deemed to be so minor that nobody even thought about them. What people were concerned about was burglary and murder. No, 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 it's a broken windows theory. One thing leads to the other. Why? because low-level social disorder, if it's not attended to, gives the impression that the people in authority really don't care enough about their environment or about their city or about their neighborhood to do anything about it. And consequently, they don't care, they don't care enough to safeguard public space. And therefore, criminals uh, of a superior nature, burglars, murderers, thieves, and so on, will be emboldened. And I think this exactly the same thing has happened in America vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, uh, the, the, the steady uh, breakdown of legality over many years, condoned and sanctioned at the highest levels of the Democratic Party, which has created a kind of environment in which people with malign intention of various kinds can come out uh, from the woodwork and say, we can get away with this. And I think that's to a large extent, what we're seeing playing out before us now in these terrible scenes in America. Melanie, I think that what you've just said more or less sums up the final point, I hope the final point, um, in which a set of ideas which have germinated as a result of the Second World War and the Holocaust, and maybe the First World War too in, in a, as a longer, uh, longer cause, have gradually spread um, by methods not very nice ones throughout our major institutions, and which at the moment in the United States have achieved what many people think is an almost revolutionary moment, um, in which they will be able, in a sense, to transform the American Constitution um, of, uh, based on liberty and freedom and the law, uh, ordered liberty, um, into something else. Uh, what that something else is, we would have to speculate. But it seems to me that sums up, you have just summed up that um, change and transformation and made clear how vital the outcome of this particular crisis is. So my final question to you, a very brief one is, if your young self joining The Guardian had listened to what you've just said to me now, what would she think? I would have thought, if I had been, uh, if I was now the Guardianista mm. that I was then, with uh, all those assumptions from the left that I had, or the liberal left that I had, I would, and listening to me now, I would mm. say, this woman is right wing. And consequently, <laughs> she is on the wrong side of everything. And consequently, when she says these are facts and this is evidence, it must be lies. And I will not listen to her. And I will not want to know her. And I hope she goes away. That's what I would have said then. It's what the left say to me and about me now. Um, and that's the, that's the terrible thing.
you can't get through this uh, with them. Um, they, in their minds, they embody virtue because they stand for the betterment of humanity and the perfection of the world. And consequently, anybody who comes along and says, well, look, here are the facts, and they don't support what you're saying. And in fact, they show that you're not only wrong, but dangerously wrong. They won't listen to that. They will say, that's a lie. And their minds are hermetically sealed shut. Why? Because if they listened, they would, they fear that their entire moral and political personality would shatter. So it's basically fear. They basically at some deep level know that they're standing on sand. They know that they can't argue. They know they haven't got the arguments. That's why they want to shut people down or shut people up and, you know, no platform people. They don't want to hear because they don't want to have to answer the question. They will never engage in the argument. They will resort all the time to insult, to character assassination, to putting labels around people's necks saying, don't go there, she's a bad person, she's right wing, she's evil, she's fascist. In order to shut it down, why? Because they don't want to have the argument. Why? Because they know they can't win the argument. Why? Because they don't have arguments that relate to reality or truth. That's the fact of it. And so they resort to intimidation, to threats, uh, to character assassination, uh, to terrible activities that we could all see happening. And, and that's the terrible thing about this. And, you know, it's, it's described as a culture war, and it is, and one side's got to win. And when you say, you know, the outcome of what's going on in America now is so crucial, I entirely agree. I believe the West is at a tipping point we don't know which way it's going to go. We don't know whether its values are going to survive this crisis of its civilization, which has been going on for so long, which is now reaching a kind of crescendo. We don't know. But good people have to fight it with all the methods that we can use, uh, consistent with our belief in civility and truth and reason. Um, and these are powerful weapons because what I've really learned in these last few years, particularly because of the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump, and whatever you think about Donald Trump, and I have great reservations about him, put it mildly, but both these th phenomena, the Brexit vote in Britain, the election of Donald Trump, are brought about by millions and millions of people who are decent people saying, we've had enough of having our country and our culture taken away from us. We had enough of being told that if we stand up for truth and for reason and for decency, we're some kind of bigot. We don't want that anymore. And we're gonna use our vote to try and make sure that we again, get our nation back, get our culture back, get the rule of law back. That's what all those millions of people said. And that's a very powerful force. And that is what keeps me going, I think, as a sign of hope for the future. Melanie, uh, in our first conversation, we talked about the fact that as a young writer, you'd written a play. And that play had been a way in which you'd worked out some of the new opinions that you were taking on board. I do wish you would write a play that sums up the world we might be going into uh, as your next exercise. And I can assure you, if you do, I'll be there on the first night. And I'm sure there'll be a second. I'll keep you <laughs> there. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, John. It's been a pleasure talking to you.